Now, if you remember last week, we saw that uh, David, remember, he desired to build a house for the ark of God to dwell in. And remember um, that God, via the prophet Nathan, he, he basically told him that he wasn't going to build the house, but that his son was going to build it. And we saw in that chapter, we saw an example of David's humility. And we look, for example, there at uh, verse number 18 of chapter number 7. It says, Then went King David in and sat before the Lord. He said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake, according to thine own heart, hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, Neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. So we saw David, and he realized, you know, he said, who am I? He was like, you know, I deserve this. He's like, who am I? And Lord, you are great. And we see that, you know, that was the attitude that David had. We also, we see that David believed what God said. Look down there at verse number 28. It says, and now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. So it's like, once again, you've said it. And we, I know it's true. I know it's true. David was someone who trusted in the Lord. That's something we see clearly in the scriptures. He was someone who trusted in the Lord. You don't need to turn there, but it says in Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. David was a man who trusted God. Psalm 84 verse 12 says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, Without faith, and what's faith? That's another word for trust. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Isaiah 26 verse number 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in me. Because he trusteth in me. Now understand, that's not saying that we're never going to have conflict in our lives when we trust God. You know, We can have peace in our minds and our hearts, even in the midst of the trials and tribulations that we go through. You know, And the, and the fact is, when we follow Jesus, we're going to go through stuff. I mean, Jesus said, you know, if the world hate you, well, you, know, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He says, if you're of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And he said, remember, remember the word that I send to you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. And so we need to understand, that's, it, it's, that's part and parcel of being a Christian. When it says in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Yea, and all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So understand, the Christian life is not a conflict-free life. In David's life, certainly, it wasn't a conflict-free life. In fact, in this chapter, we're going to see him go through a whole string of battles. And yet, in all of that, God preserved him. God preserved him. Psalm 91 verse 14 says, Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him in honor. So, in other words, God's not saying that you're not going to have any troubles. But he's going to deliver you within your troubles. Anyway, let's jump into chapter, verse number 1. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass, sorry, and after this it came to pass, that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methegema out of the hand of the Philistines. So David, he starts out this chapter fighting the Philistines. Now, that, that's nothing new. That's nothing new. I mean, David, hasn't he been doing that since he was young? You know, I mean, cast your mind back to, to when he defeated Goliath. You know, back, remember his brothers, they were in Saul's army. He was just a shepherd boy. Who was, I mean, who was, Goliath was a Philistine. They were fighting. They were at war with the Philistines. Um, Goliath, he was actually a giant. He wasn't you know, just a regular sized person. He was a giant from Gath. And it's actually Gath that, in this chapter here, where it says that uh, David took um, Methigma out of the hand of the Philistines, that's actually referring to Gath. That's, a, that's another name for it. If you look at, um, keep your finger in, in 2 Samuel 8, but look at 1 Chronicles chapter number 18. 1 Chronicles chapter number 18, in the uh, parallel passage, 1 Chronicles chapter number 18, it says, um, Now after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines. And this is going through exactly the same thing that we're going to read to. He took it, but here it's referred to as Gath. 
And so, um, back in 2 Samuel chapter number 8, when it refers to the thing about, I mean, maybe that was just another name for it, or maybe that was one of the towns within the larger, within the larger area of Gath. Either of those are possible. Because you, you do see these differences in names. I mean, back in, um, in 1 Chronicles chapter number 18, it refers to someone called uh, uh, Tohu, King Tohu, for example, in verse number, uh, where are we? Verse number 9. 1 Chronicles 18, 9 says, Now when King Tohu, king of Hamath, heard how David had smitten all the host of um, Hadareza, king of Zobah, well, if we compare that to what we've got over here, it's got uh, verse number 9, when Tohu, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the host of Hadadiza. So we've got Hadadiza, Hadareza, we've got Tohu, we've got Tohu, we've got all those different names for calling different things. I mean, that's just, that's, just, that's just the way life is. People use different names to this day. You know, they call people all sorts of different things. Anyway, let's jump back to uh, verse number two. Verse number two. So he defeated the Philistines. He took Gath. Verse number two. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. So as well as defeating the Philistines, he defeated the Moabites. He killed two-thirds of them, while the remaining one-third became his servants, and they had to pay a tribute. Now, the Moabites, you might sort of wonder, who are these Moabites? Moabites, just if you remember, they were descended from Lot's, one of Lot's daughters. Remember, Lot had, had, had two daughters, and one of them um, had a child called Moab, and one of them had a child called, um, was it Ben Ammi, I think it was. And basically, the Moabites descended from one, and the Ammonites descended from the other. And um, when the Israelites came into the land, they didn't actually take land from the Moabites because God told them not to. Keep your finger in 2 Samuel chapter number 8 and look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 2. Deuteronomy chapter number 2 and verse number 8. Deuteronomy chapter number 2 and verse number 8. It says, And we, when we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from Elath and from Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for possession, because I have given Ah unto the children of Lot for possession. And so God told them, you know, when they, when, they, when, they, when they came out of Egypt, they weren't given the land of the Moabites. But then later on, the Moabites fought with them. And they actually even ruled over the Israelites during the time of the Judges. You might remember that there's a time in, in Judges, Judges chapter 3, and it records... There was, there, was a, there was a king called Eglon, who was the king of Moab, and for 18 years he ruled over the Israelites. Um, the Bible records that he was, I think he was like a really fat guy, really, really fat guy, and, um, and they ended up being, being delivered, there was a guy, Ehud, the son of Gera, and he delivered them. Remember, he was, he was um, now which way around was it? I think he probably, he, he might have been, was he left-handed? Did he have it on his, which of a thigh? He had like a dagger on one of his thighs, and it, was, and it was hidden there. And he went in to see the king, he actually went in to see, and he like, like, went in to, 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 to take him a gift and stuff, and he said, you know, um, I've got something secret to tell you. And so the king puts everyone else out of the room, and he whips his dagger out and stabs him in the gut, and it disappears right up. And he delivered them. He delivered them out of the hand. But notice, they were ruled over by the Moabites. They ruled over them for 18, for 18 years. You know? And, um, yeah, even right back when Israel came out of Egypt, when Israel came out of Egypt, the, the, the Moabites and the Ammonites also attacked them. They attacked them. You know? In fact, if you look at, um, look at Joshua chapter number 24, Joshua chapter number 24 and verse number 6, Joshua chapter number 24 and verse number 6, because you know, when you see just David fighting these random battles, you can sometimes think, well, what's he just doing going fighting here and fighting there? Is he just some sort of bloodthirsty guy? He's just trying to you know, just make a name for himself? But no, I mean, look back at the history here. Look at Joshua chapter number 24, verse number 6. It says, And I brought your fathers out of Egypt when you came into the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I've done in Egypt, and you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And this, we won't look into the story now, but you know, this, king, this king Balak, he, he called Balaam, who was like this false prophet, he called him to come in and, and curse the people. 
And to start with, he, to start with God said, no, don't go with him. And then, but he just he wanted to go because he was going to get paid something for it. And so he goes, and he's on his donkey, he's riding along, and, 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 and it's like an angel appears in the way that he can't see, but the donkey can see it, and he's going to you know, chop his head off. And so the donkey's, no, I'm not going this way, I'm not going this way. And he's beating it, trying to make it go. But he ends up going. And, um, but he doesn't curse them. Because he says, well, no, I, I can't curse whom God has blessed. And so he, he refuses to do that. But here's the thing. Although he didn't curse them, he actually attacked them another way. He attacked them another way. And Numbers 25, we won't go there now, but Numbers 25 records that immediately after Balaam left, the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. You know? It says, and they called the people under the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And Revelation chapter 2 verse 14 tells us that Balaam was the one. Balaam was the one who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 describes how 23,000 Israelites fell in one day because of that. 23,000 of them were killed in one day because of the sin they committed with the daughters of Moab. And so you know, look, this wasn't some little thing. This wasn't some little thing. And of course, it's not a little thing when people commit fornication today. People think today, oh, I can just commit fornication and it's fine. It doesn't affect anyone. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that at all. If 23,000 people can be killed in one day, I mean, how many people's lives to this day have been destroyed by fornication? How many people has that happened to? Countless people. I mean, do you know who, do you know who springs to mind? When, I, when you think about fornication, you think about people being killed? Do you know what I think of? I think of all the aborted babies. I think of millions of aborted babies that there's been because someone's committed fornication, a child has been conceived, and then someone said, we'll take it to the doctor and they'll kill it. They'll murder it. That's, that's a wicked, wicked sin. And, and God will require the blood that people have shed. You know, let's continue on. It says, um, so just understand though, this is what David did with the, with the Moabites. He executed judgment upon them. But we need, we need to understand, the people of Moab, Moab they, it's not that they were all wicked. It's not that they were all wicked. I mean, David himself, David's great-grandmother was actually Ruth the what? The Moabites. Yeah, the Ruth the Moabites. You know, but of course, um, she left the false gods of her own people. She joined herself to God's people. She said to Naomi, thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Let's continue on verse number three. It says, And David smote Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, and he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. And David hopped all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. So David, he fought against Hadadezer, king of Zobah. He destroyed the army, except for a few chariots he took from himself. Verse number five. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to succor or to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So the Syrians, they heard that David was fighting against Hadadezer. They came to help the king of Zobah, but they got defeated. And David ends up putting troops into Syria. They serve him, they pay tribute. It's like they're paying tax. And God is the one who is looking after David. Now, just to understand, it says here, look, the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Why? Because David was someone who trusted in God. You know, look at, um, we mentioned before, Psalm 91. Look at, it, look at it again now. Look at Psalm 91, verse number 2. Psalm 91, and verse number 2. It says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowl and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. 
Only with thine eyes shall the behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And so you understand, look, you know, God protected David. Because he trusted him, God protected him. And, and this is not just some Old Testament prophet. You know, it's not just a promise that we find in the Old Testament to say David's going to be protected. I mean, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says of angels that they are what they describe as ministering spirits. Ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Well, that's us. Angels are actually sent. I don't know if you realise that, but angels are actually sent forth to protect us, to minister to us, to serve us, to look after us. People who are going to be heirs of salvation. Turn back to uh, 2 Samuel verse number, chapter 8, verse number 7. Verse number 7. And it says, And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Betar and from Berathai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took exceeding much brass. So David took lots of treasure. He took lots of treasure from those that he defeated in battle. Look at uh, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter number 13. Of verse number, actually, no, don't need to now. I'll just read it out. Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaveth an inheritance for his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. David was a just man. David was a righteous man, and the wealth of sinners is actually laid up for him, and he's, he's taking the spoil. It kind of reminds me a bit of like when, the, when, when they left Egypt. You know, he says, you'll spoil the Egyptians. Well, they, they borrowed, you know, gold and all sorts of stuff before they came out. Look at verse number 9. And when Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the host of Hadadezer, then Toi sent Joram, his son, unto King David to salute him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and smitten him. For Hadadezer had wars with Toi. And Joram brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass. So when Toi, or, or as it's called in, in First Chronicles, Tau, king of Hamath, Hears that David has defeated the king of Zobah, he sends his son to congratulate him. And what does he do? He sends him silver and gold and brass. He sends all these, 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 these things to reward him because of what he's done. And obviously, the reason for that is because, you know, Toai was someone who was fighting with Hadadezer. It's kind of like, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. I mean, you know, because David's, obviously, this guy's been continually fighting with this king, and David's now defeated him. And so he's like, okay, well, you're my friend, and so I'm going to give you these things in reward. Look at verse number 11. Which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord, with the silver and the gold they had dedicated of all the nations which he had subdued, of Syria and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobar. So notice here, David's not just sort of taking all this treasure and he's not just taking it, well, this is just for me. This is what I'm gaining from it. David dedicates the valuables which he's been given and won in battle, he dedicates it to the Lord. He dedicates to the Lord. What does that mean? Have a look at um, 2 Chronicles chapter number 2. 2 Chronicles chapter number 2. When King Solomon takes over from David, look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 2 and verse number 1. 2 Chronicles chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Because remember how David wasn't going to build a house for the Lord? His son Solomon was. It says in verse number 1, And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And Solomon told out, Three score and ten thousand men to bear burdens, and four score thousand to hew in the mountain, and three thousand and six hundred to oversee them. And Solomon sent to Huram, king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David my father, and didst send him cedars to build him a house, to dwell therein, even so deal with me. Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, and to burn before him sweet incense, for the continual showbread, and for the burnt offerings for morning and evening on the Sabbaths and on the new moons, and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance for ever to Israel. And the house which I build is great, for great is our God above all gods. But who is able to build him in house, seeing the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I, then, that I should build him in house, save only to burn sacrifice before him? Send me now therefore a man cunning to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in iron, and purple, and crimson, and blue, and that can skill to grave with the cunning men that are with me in Judah and in Jerusalem, whom David, my father, did provide. So notice, he's going to be building all this stuff. We won't sort of look at it now, but I mean, you can look through chapter number three, you can look through chapter number four, and it's going through all the stuff that was built and how it was 
you know, things were plated with gold and, and they used the brass and all the stuff that David had laid in store. In fact, if you look at chapter number 5, verse number 1, it says, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the instruments, putty among the treasures of the house of God. So all this stuff, this was stuff, David was thinking of God again. He was thinking of his glory. He was thinking of, you know, even though he didn't end up building this house and the stuff, his son Solomon did, but David put all this stuff in store for him to make it easy. So imagine, you think about that, what it's like. You think about, I don't know if you've ever had a house, we've had a couple of houses we've built before, and, when, you know, and you're waiting for the different trucks to arrive and they come with all the things on, they've got all the blocks there, or the, you know, the big lump, you know, the, 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 the trusses, the, you know. I mean, these days it all comes prefabricated, so it's sort of pretty quick. But think about how easy it would be to build a house when all the stuff's there. You've got everything you need. It's just like putting it together. You know, you don't have to go and chop down the trees. You don't have to chop down the trees and take them to sawmill and, and you know, saw them and do all the stuff you've got to do and dry them out, and etc. Et but everything's all done. So that's what David did. He prepared for Solomon to make it easy for him to build this house, the temple of the Lord. Looking back at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 13. Verse number 13. And David gave him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. So David became even more famous. And he put garrisons in Edom throughout all Edom, put he garrisons. And all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So David, he was you know, famed for conquering the Syrians. He was famous. But he also conquered the Edomites. And it's interesting to note, when David conquered Edom, and when he made Edom serve him, this was actually an important fulfillment of prophecy. This was a prophecy that was fulfilled. You know, this is one of the reasons why we know that the Bible is actually the work of God, and not the work of man, because the Bible contains prophecies that get fulfilled. And every prophecy in the Bible either has been fulfilled, or, or it will be fulfilled in the future. And this is an example, you think, well, what's the big deal about this? Well, this is actually a significant prophecy. This is a prophecy that you'll find in the, in the Old Testament. This is a prophecy you actually find referred to in the New Testament. Look, if you would, back at, um, look back at Genesis chapter number 25. Genesis chapter number 25. Because notice what it says here. So we've got the Edomites became David's servants. We say, what's the relevance of that? Well, look at um, Genesis chapter number 25, verse number 20. Genesis chapter number 25 and verse number 20. It says... And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And you might think, looking there, it's like, okay, she was barren, and then she conceived. But in actual fact, it, it was 20 years. It was 20 years between, um, you know, that, that he prayed. Some people think, oh, you know, if I pray, God's going to give me a child. I'll wait for a year, wait for two year, and then they and then they go off to the doctor. You know, I, mean, I know people that have, that have done that. They they go to the doctor because you know we can't have children, and so what can we do? We can you know let's take it into our own hands. You know, I mean, what what do people get these days? What's it called? IVF, in vitro fertilization. Christians do that. I know Christians who get IVF, but what happens when you get IVF? Take a bunch of eggs. You know, you fertilise them, and then you pick the ones you like, you throw some of them out, you put some of them in the freezer, you implant other ones. What happens to those ones that get thrown out? Well, that's, you know, that's living things. What's the difference between that and having an abortion? We talked about before, the murder of, of an abortion. What's the difference with that? What about the ones that get put in the freezer? They just get put in the freezer and left there, and just, they keep them there forever? No. Eventually they get thrown out. Okay? And so we need to understand that God, the Bible makes it clear, and this is not, we're not sort of preaching on this, but God opens and closes the womb. He does. He opens and closes the womb. God is able to open someone if it's not the right time. And the, I mean, and understand, there can be other reasons for it. You know, and maybe it's because it's God's will or not, but maybe it's because of things that you're doing. I mean, a lot of reasons why people can't conceive is because they go on birth control pills. They have birth control pills, and then they say, oh, I want a baby now, so then they stop taking the birth control pills, and lo and behold, they can't conceive straight away. Because they've done stuff to their body, they've messed with their body, you know, and um, 
Anyway, let's, sorry, but don't want to be distracted because we don't want to be here too long. Um, so yeah, Isaac entreats the Lord for his wife. She was barren. The Lord has entreated him. Rebecca, his wife, conceived. And the children, look at this. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. This is the prophecy that's been, that, that, that we've seen in Second Samuel chapter 8. He's saying, look, you're going to have two children, and the elder is going to serve the younger. Yeah. Well, who are these children? When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out reared all over like a hairy garment, and they called him Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was, oh there we go, three score years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And so we see here, this is Jacob and Esau. Do you know what Esau is also called? Edom. He's called Edom. And about Jacob? Well, God changes Jacob's name. What did he change Jacob's name to? Israel. So this is Edom and Israel. So here's the prophecy saying what's going to happen. The elder shall serve the younger. Who's the elder? The elder is Esau. From him came the Edomites. The younger is Jacob. From him came the Israelites. And so Edom, the elder, is going to serve Israel, the younger. That's what the prophecy said. Now, some people say, well, this was, this was talking about the people. They're saying, you know, that Esau was going to serve Jacob. You know, and maybe one of the reasons they get that is because if you look in the New Testament, look at Romans chapter number 9, and Romans chapter number 9, verse number, I'll maybe just start at verse number 1, Romans chapter number 9, and verse number 1, it says, I say the truth, this is Apostle Paul speaking, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, though I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who was over all God blessed forever. Amen. Look at verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So notice he's saying look, there's a di distinction between Abraham's children, because Abraham had, had different children. He says, look, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. You see, you don't become a children of God by who your parents are. You don't. It's not about who you are. It doesn't matter what mum and, you know, I mean, I, in fact, we talk to someone, you know, many times I've talked to people. It's like, well, you know, my parents are, are ministers. You know? He says, no, look, children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise accounted for the seed. And obviously, the, the thing that, you know, specifics you're applying to is, Guess what? You're not a child of God because you're Jewish. Because you're a descendant of Israel. Because you're a descendant of Abraham. That's not what makes you. The child of the children of the flesh. No. The children of the promise account of the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by one, even by her father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to Election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. This is what we've seen before. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Yeah. Now this is a passage of scripture that Calvinists love to turn to. Because they love to say, look, God loved Jacob. He chose him to be saved and go to heaven. God hated Esau. He hated Esau, and he chose him to go to hell. That's what they say. It's before the children were born, that's what, they were, that's what they were chosen for. But, here's the thing. The prophecy of the elder serving the younger is not something that ever happened in the life of Jacob and the life of Esau. 
I mean, if, I mean, we've gone through the whole book of Genesis before. And when did Esau ever serve Jacob? He never did. The opposite is actually true. Jacob was the one. You know, he he was he served in pottage, you know. But he, but he, he I mean, he was the one. He was he was afraid of his brother. You know, he ran away. And when he came back, he sent him special gifts. And you know, no stage was it ever a case of you know Esau serving Jacob. That never happened. That never happened. But does that mean that the prophecy is wrong? No, because that's not what it's talking about. That's why it says both in Genesis twenty-five and here, it talks about the people. It says, um, "Sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter." There was uh, da 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 da. I'm sure I saw it in here. Oh, so yeah, sorry. It says the elder shall serve the younger. But back in Genesis chapter number 25, and it says, Unto her two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So this is the elder people shall serve the younger people. In other words, it's the nation that came from Jacob and the nation that came from Esau. And that's exactly what we see in 2 Samuel chapter number 8. Because it's the only time in the Bible we discover, guess what? What happens to the Edomites? The Edomites, he put David, King David, the king of Israel, puts garrisons in Edom. And they became David's servants, which is exactly what he said would happen. That's exactly, and so this shows us that this is not talking about individuals. God chose those nations. He chose those nations. It says the, it says the same thing in, in, in Malachi. Malachi chapter number 1. In Malachi 1, this is another passage that um, where it's quoted here, Malachi chapter number 1, this is the second part, where it says, um, Jacob have I loved. Malachi chapter number 1, it says, um, verse 2, I've loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Jacob Esau's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, notice this, and laid his mountains and its heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, whereas Edom saith, because Esau and Edom is the same, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. So notice, God's got an issue with the Edomites. Why? Because they're wicked. It wasn't because of the actual person Esau. It was the, it was the people. And so it wasn't that God just chose Jacob to be saved and he chose Esau to go to hell. He chose those particular people. He chose those nations. I mean, Israel was God's chosen people to accomplish the purpose that he had for them. But, I mean, obviously when they walked in a way that displeased God, what did God do? He put them out of the land. You know? And if someone from one of these other, you know, unchosen groups, I mean, like the Moabites. Like the Moabites. Ruth the Moabites. Guess what? She gets grafted in. God becomes her God. She becomes one of God's people. And so this, this whole thing of Calvinism, it's just it's a completely false, it's a load of nonsense. It's a complete load of nonsense. They just teach that it's got nothing whatsoever to do. I mean, it's, it's, I mean if, if you go through Tulip, it's pretty much just take what the Bible says and just make everything the opposite of that. You know? They say that we're so totally depraved that we can't believe. They say, look, a dead person can't believe. So therefore God has to regenerate you and make you alive in order for you to believe. But I mean, that's a silly illustration because a dead person can't sin either. You know? They're confusing what the Bible says when it's referring to the, the spiritual man versus the physical person. We're not physically dead. I mean, the, what does that say? Our unconditional election. God just chooses this person to be saved and chooses this person to go to hell. Unconditional election. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sounds like this is a condition. You've got to believe. You know, the Bible says, you know, they say, limited atonement, that Jesus only died for the people that God chose. But the Bible says that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You know? They talk about irresistible grace, you know, that God... He chooses you and he forces you to be saved. So you've got no choice in the matter. Well, the Bible says, you, Jesus said you'd always resist the Holy Ghost. Actually, Stephen said that. Yeah. 
He says, you'd always resist the Holy Ghost. He says, your fathers did, so do ye. You know? Well, what Jesus said, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered your, you know, your children like, like a hen gathers her chicks. And ye would not. You resisted. You refused. And they also teach the, um, the perseverance of the saints. You're going to keep enduring to the end. In order to be saved, you've got to keep on working, keep on working. I know someone talked the other day, and it was, what they were saying it was about, oh, they didn't like the word work, so you've got to strive. You've got to be striving in order to be saved. You've got to strive to do what's right. But the Bible says, look, when someone gets saved, they get born again. They've passed from death unto life. They shall not come into condemnation. It's happened. It's just, have you been born again or not? Because if you've been born again, Jesus said, you shall never perish. Neither shall you man pluck them out of my hands. Whereas the Calvinist says, well, no, we'll have to wait and see. How do you do? You know, are you going to, are you going to survive for then? I mean, a lot of Calvinists I know, <laughs> late in life, they don't seem to persevere too well. They seem to do pretty poorly. You know, where's this, this onward and upward, ever increase it? You know, the Calvinists that I know, by and large, they do less by the time they get into later life. Anyway, save that for another time. Back in uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 8. 2 Samuel chapter number 8. Verse number 15. And David reigned over all Israel. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And that's what he's supposed to do as a ruler, isn't he? He's the ruler of the people. He's supposed to be executing judgment and justice. You know, it says in Romans chapter number 13. Romans chapter number 13. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers... For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God has ordained that there be rulers. And what are rulers supposed to do? They're supposed to execute judgment and justice. Whoso therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So we shouldn't be resisting the governing powers. Well, unless of course the governing powers are doing wicked things. And, are, and, are, you know, and, and they're not doing what God ordained that they should be doing. Because what did God ordain they should do? Well, look, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Is that, I mean, is that really true? Or is it, well, actually, some rulers are a, a terror to good works. I mean, think about Adolf Hitler. You do good works, then you'll be fine with him? No, he, he was a terror to people who did evil works, did, did, did good works. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But that's not what they necessarily do in, in most countries. If you do what's right, then you might find they're trying to you know, execute judgment against you. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute or tax also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. That's what they're supposed to be doing. Executing judgment and justice upon the evildoers. But evildoers, that's not what, they don't get judgment and justice. The sword doesn't come upon them. We put them up. You know, we'll pay $100,000 a year, we'll put a roof over your head and we'll feed you, and we'll put you with a bunch of people that'll teach you how to be really good at being bad. That's a great idea. Anyway, turn back to uh, 2 Samuel. Verse number 16. And Job the son of Zeruiah was over the host, and Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilad was the recorder, and Zadok the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech the son of Abiathar were priests, and Sariah was the scribe, and Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Kerithites and the Palathites, and David's sons were chief rulers. So it's worth noting here, David didn't do everything by himself. He didn't do everything by himself. He had many people that helped him. He had Joab, and Jehoshaphat, and Zadok, and Sariah, and Beniah. He had all these different people. His sons, different people were helping him. And we realise that the Bible tells us in Romans 15, 4, it says, For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So we, when we read these things in the Old Testament, there's stuff we can learn from that. What do you think we can learn from this? Well, David didn't do everything by himself. We don't do everything by ourselves. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. And verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 
In verse number 12, it says, For as the body is one and hath many members, so and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So the body of Christ, the church, is like a, it's like a body and it's got different body parts. Let me look at verse, um, verse number 14. It says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? In other words, look, look at your foot, look at your hand. Are they they're different? They're not the same, are they? Your hand and your foot are different from each other. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? I mean, eyes and ears, they're different. They have different functions, but they're all still part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Imagine if you had eyes there instead of ears. Well, you'd be able to see without turning your head, but you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to hear If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? If you just had ears everywhere, you couldn't smell. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. We need all the parts. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. You see, it doesn't matter how important you might think you are. You're necessary. When anyone's not here, we're lacking. You know, I mean, what, which body part would you like to cut off and not and do without? He says, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism or no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one of another, no, one for another. So we should be caring for each other. And that's a sign of a good body when people care for each other. You know, some churches are like, well, you know, I've got this little group over here, and I've got this little group here. I don't talk to those people, I don't like those people. That's not what it should be like. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. So in Think about that. When someone's going through a hard time, that should affect you. Because you should, be, you should be praying for someone who's going through difficult times. Thinking, how can I help? You know? I mean, immediately had we got a sting yesterday. And it was, it was only in a, like a little wee thumb. It wasn't a big thing. It wasn't a big part of the body that was hurt. But her whole body was wailing and howling. She was, she was suffering. When one little part suffers, the whole suffers with it. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. When something good happens to someone, we should all be rejoicing. Isn't it? It's fantastic when someone gets saved. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're the one who gets someone saved or someone else. It doesn't matter. We should all rejoice together. You know, someone, someone gets, a, gets a, you know, a, a pay rise. Someone gets something good happen to them. You know, get a new job. Yeah. We, should be, we should be glad. We should rejoice. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some of the church first, because this, no, this is what it's talking about. It's not just some physical body. It's actually the church he's talking about. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? You say, No. We're all different. We're just in the same way that we're not all, you know, you're not just all eyes or all hands or all ears. Guess what? We're not all apostles or prophets or tongue speakers or whatever. And that kind of puts paid to all the Pentecostal nonsense. He says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I, unto, uh, show I unto you a more excellent way. And as he goes through, the next chapter is all about charity. It's all about love. Love and care for one another. Turn to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 4. Romans 12 verse 4 it says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. That's exactly the same thing we saw before. Many members, one body, but we're not all the same. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, 
with a prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, and bore that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love and honour preferring one another. It's the same thing, we've all got different roles, different parts, but we should be preferring one another. We should have love, we should have care for each other. Keep your finger in Romans 12, because that's where we're going to sing shortly. But In 2 Samuel 8, we, what we've seen, we've, we saw David, he was busy doing the work. He was busy doing the work that he was supposed to do. Notice, he fight this battle over here, he's fighting this battle over here, he's fighting, over, he's busy, he's working. Yes. Later on, as we get through 2 Samuel, we actually see the trouble David gets into when he neglects some of his, some of his duties, what he's supposed to be doing, when he doesn't do it. And the same thing applies to us. You see, we should be busy doing the work that God has given us to do. It says in Colossians 1.10, this, this is Paul praying for the Colossians. He says, and you praise them that, they, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what God wants them to do. Look at, um, actually look at, keep your finger in Romans, but look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse number 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 3 says, Remember without ceasing your work of faith. Notice that. Because you believe this work you should be doing. And labour of love. Guess what? Because you love, you should be working. And patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Look at chapter 4, verse number 11. He says, You study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. It's important that the believers work. Look at 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 3. Verse number 10, he says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. We should be working. And people who won't work, they shouldn't eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but as the busybodies. Now them that are such, we suggest. I don't know, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness, they work and eat their own bread. He's saying, be quiet and get to work. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. 1 Timothy 5 9 says, Let not a widow be taken into number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. What are those good works? If you've brought up children. If you've lodged strangers, if you've washed the saints' feet, if you've relieved the afflicted, if you've diligently followed every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. God's got work that he wants us to do. Prepare yourself for it. How can you be prepared? Be sanctified. Be sanctified. Titus 3.1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Hebrews 16 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labour of love, which you've showed toward his name, and that you've ministered to the saints and do minister. Look, you've worked. He's not going to forget this, your labour of love that you've done. Revelation 22.12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to every man according as his work shall be. God's interested in our works. He wants us to work. We saw David doing work. He was working. Now, his, his, guess what? His work is a bit different than ours. He was going around fighting people, you know, chopping people's heads off, you know, hocking the horses and, you know, doing all sorts. That's who, he was fighting a physical battle. And we know that, obviously, that's not the battle we're supposed to fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. You know? The work we're supposed to be doing, in fact, it says in um, 2 Timothy 4, 5, says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. How about this? Do the work of an evangelist. That's a great work. That's a great work for us to be doing. Jesus said, as my Father sent me, so send I you. He's given us work to do. Jesus said, look, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labourers few. Labourers are few. He said, "Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest." Well, that's work. Pray, 
Pray there for the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labourers into his harvest. What's that? Workers into his harvest. That's us. That's the work God has given us to do. It's great to see people you know, getting out soul winning for the first time. It's great to see people knocking doors for the first time. God has given us work. We should be encouraging one another in that work. You know? When you go, even if, even if you're just a silent partner, when you go out with someone, that's an encouragement to them. That's a real encouragement to them. You know? Even if you're not at the stage of talking yet, say, hey, can we go soul winning? When can we go soul winning? Organise a time. God's given us work to do. And we want to be busy. We want to be busy about our Father's business. That's what Jesus was. He was constantly working. He was labouring. Because he was given a job. It says in John 17, I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the work which thou gave us me to do. That's how we bring glory to God, by doing the work that he's given us to do. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of David. He was, he was working. He was working, doing the job that he'd been appointed. We've got a different job than he had. Our job is to preach the gospel. One of the last things he said before you left, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Help us to fulfill that great commission that you've given us. Help us to have a burden for the lost. Help us to see that there are souls that need to be saved. That we need to have compassion. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating them in the garments spotted by the flesh. Lord, thank you for giving us the ministry of reconciliation. Help us to beseech people in your stead. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving your life that we might have life. Help us to obey your commandments and to walk in a way that pleases you and show our love to you. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.